Okay, so what I want to talk about today is probably a bit different um, in terms of really providing an overview of what some of the challenges are in terms of managing um, the future changes that are occurring along coral reef coastlines. And so, you know, if we step back and we think about what some of the, the greatest um, coastal management challenges are globally, you know, at the forefront of these challenges um, is really, you know, what's going to happen to um, communities that are associated with, with coral reefs. Um, so these are among the most vulnerable populations, as we know. So they're um, low-lying, often on islands, you know, f five meters or less um, above mean sea level, usually dense coastal populations concentrated on small um, land masses. The freshwater supplies are, are quite vulnerable to, you know, coastal inundation, so salinization of groundwater. They're in tropical areas, so exposed to extreme events like tropical cyclones. Um, and also, if we think about, you know, what some of the coastal engineering approaches that are used, these really large-scale coastal engineering approaches that are used in, in developing countries, a lot of these countries don't have the capacity to, to kind of uh, adapt and mitigate um, changes that are occurring. Um, so, you know, if you spend time, you know, around a lot of, you know, island nations in the Indo-Pacific, there's a lot of very common challenges and very common problems where a lot of countries are having, you know, major coastal erosion, not just local erosion, but really large-scale erosion. Um, and so there's a pressing need to come up with coastal adaptation and um, mitigation strategies. And the way this tends to sort of work is, you know, they'll countries will get some aid money or, or a big pot of money and then go to kind of overseas consultants, like engineering companies that, you know, try imposing these, you know, um, engineering solutions that are, that are sort of set up and developed for, for different um, environments. And so there's a lot of evidence that these, you know, they're very expensive. They've proved inadequate for kind of reef coastlines. They eventually fail. Sometimes they cause worse problems than they were designed to fix. So things like revetments, um, seawalls, um, breakwaters, and so they're sort of these band-aid solutions to more complex um, problems. And so in terms of, you know, one of the major reasons why this is the case is because the knowledge base that's used to predict coastal processes, um, it has a really strong foundation, there's really um, solid models, and but they've been really developed through decades of work on open coast sandy um, beaches. And so this is really over, you know, f at least four or five decades, a lot of money, a lot of effort in Europe and in North America in terms of big field programs, developing models. But if you look into these models, a lot of the assumptions, um, the, there's a lot of empiricism that's based in these, and they're not really suitable, we're finding, to apply these to reef environments, yet they're commonly are applied. Um, so from this knowledge base, you know, the way we think about, say, predicting coastal erosion and coastal changes, um, you know, the idea that sort of emerged in the 90s is this idea of coastal morphodynamics, where if we can predict the processes that occur, so this is things like waves and currents, um, we could, say, on a beach, predict the, the rates of sediment transports, so the sand moving on or off, and then over time, as that occurs, we can predict the, the morphological changes, um, so erosion or accretion. And so this is sort of the widely used approach, and there's models that are routinely applied. But as I want to talk about really today are, are why these models break down and what are really the challenges with applying these kind of approaches to um, tropical reef um, coastlines. And the underlying reason is because there's really strong connections that are ignored between the reef ecosystems that are and, and the physical um, environment. Okay, so just to, to provide an overview, I just want to talk about a few challenges, and I'll talk about some of the work we've done really over the last decade um, in this. So one of the first um, challenges is, is improving predictions of reef hydrodynamic processes, so things like um, waves and currents, which really drive, are the, the main driver of, of shoreline changes. Um, and again, as we step back and we think about where a lot of models that are used to predict erosion are based on are, are your conventional kind of sandy beaches. They have mild slopes. They're usually quite a longshore uniform, you know, relatively smooth sandy um, seabeds. If we contrast that to, you know, reef coastlines, we have um, steep um, slopes often, almost, you know, vertical if we think about some four reefs, really complex three-dimensional morphologies. 
And one of the other important things is, is the habitat itself creating large bottom roughness by the various organisms, which has a major influence on the hydrodynamics. Um, so one of the things, so we spent a lot of time really over the last decade um, improving predictions of, of how waves go, go from the deep ocean and to, to reach the shoreline, since it's really the shoreline, the, the wave energy that reaches shorelines, it's important for understanding erosion. Um, and the basic idea, as you can imagine, this is just showing Ningaloo, where we have waves that tend to break on the shallow um, leading edge on the reef crest. Um, but what's not as obvious is, um, this is showing some work uh, quite, quite a while ago now in Hawaii, where you can see these are wave measurements, um, just focusing on this site here, so the waves are moving this direction. This is inshore of the, the um, surf zone, so waves are no longer breaking here, but you can see from this data here that the wave heights just gradually um, reduce and attenuate to the point where at the back reef there's no wave energy left. And so this is not due to wave breaking, it's due to the, the roughness characteristics, the wave kind of orbital motions, the, the drag that's, that's removing that wave energy. And it's worth saying that this is a sort of an algal reef, it's not as rugose as you would find in many reefs, yet it's still removing about 60% of the incident wave energy. So a lot of the work has been in terms of approving models where we can describe these processes. Um, one of the other um, complex kind of challenges is, um, you know, when waves break, that that energy is not lost. It's, it's, it ends up going to driving other kinds of flows in, in reef environments. And so um, if you think about wave-exposed coastlines, um, the circulation that tends to really be um, dominant is driven by waves. So when waves break, they generate forces. So you know, when you have a wave break on you, you feel that force. Those forces push the water in the direction of the waves when they break, and so you get circulation where we get water, in this case, uh, moving across the reef and then... For fringing reefs with channels, the water returns back to the ocean through channels. Um, and so these are very complex kind of processes to look at the coupling between waves and currents and so on. So made a lot of advances in terms of um, improving these models. And you can just see here, this is showing Ningaloo in terms of the, just an illustration where the arrows show the current direction. So you can see onshore flow over the reefs and then flow exiting and just showing, um, you know, really just to illustrate how strongly, how important these wave-driven flows are. You can see the currents um, at three different sites as a function of the wave heights. And so despite having tides, the, the waves still really um, dominate the circulation. Okay, so one of the, the areas that spending quite a bit of, of time recently, and this is actually getting, there's a lot of people in the international community looking at, at this, and I'll spend a bit of time just talking about why it's important. Um, it's on reefs what we're increasingly finding in terms of shoreline flooding and, and erosion. They're really being driven by these low frequency, what are called infragravity waves. So the basic idea is that you, if you've spent time on, you know, we all have spent time in the ocean, and, and we know that waves don't always arrive at the same height, that they come in groups or, or sets. Um, these waves that you see breaking are, you know, swell waves, for example, have periods of 10, 20 seconds. Um, but when these waves break in groups, the groups tend to occur with periods much longer, usually several minutes. And when these groups end up breaking on, on reefs, they, when you have a set of, of, wave, of bigger waves, it causes an elevation of the, the water level, and then you have a lull in the waves and then a fall. And so you get a forcing of these low-frequency waves with periods of minutes. And we're finding that, particularly on the back reef, the shoreline areas of reefs, that if you look at the height, say this is the swell waves at, at, at Ningaloo as an example, is blue, the red is these low frequency waves. Once you get all the way back to the shoreline, you start to get a dominance of these, these low frequency um, waves. So if we really want to understand erosion and flooding, we have to consider these, um, these low frequency wave motions. The reason this is getting a, a lot of attention um, is in terms of looking at extreme storms and in regions where you see extreme storm damage. Um, what we're finding, and this is this particular example is some work by colleagues in Japan, um, where there was really severe damage to a part of the Philippines during Typhoon um, Haiyan. And the idea is that reefs, based on their morphology, they have what's called a satiating frequency. So if you disturb the reef, you'll get a, a satiating going back and forth of, of water. And you probably heard that the term resonance, that if you force a system at its natural frequency, you get an amplification, you can get extreme um, amplification of these. Um, and so this is a case where the wave groups matched the natural frequency of the system, and you had just really 
in catastrophic flooding. So this is showing an image. So this is not a tsunami coming through. This is actually these low-frequency waves that are sloshing back and forth with, with minute, um, minute frequencies. And so this was a region, and so now people have gone back and looked at this, this process, and this was totally unexpected um, in terms of the damage that, that occurred. So it's a lot of attention in understanding these kind of processes. Um, the second challenge I just want to talk about is, is if we consider the current state of reefs, um, the, the, the challenge is with actually predicting erosion and, and shoreline changes. Um, and so it's widely assumed that, you know, as I talked about, waves are dissipating, they're breaking energy, they're reducing wave energy that reaches the shoreline. So this you should, in theory, make, you know, beaches more stable, reduce erosion. That's generally the case. But what we find is that it's not always, and there's a lot more complicated processes in terms of predicting the erosion that, that occurs. Um, for reference, if we think about your classic kind of erosion, what drives seasonal beach erosion on your normal kind of beaches, we have, you know, say during um, winter when we get bigger waves, we get erosion of, of sand that moves offshore, usually deposits, forms sandbars, and then when the waves um, decrease, we get a movement of that sand back um, onshore. So when we predict erosion on beaches, we're really focusing on the cross-shore movement of sand going back and forth seasonally. And so we've looked at a number of reefs now along the WA coast. This is just showing a, a case of a temperate reef system, but the ideas are the same. Um, looking at some, you can see the waves breaking in these areas. So these are shallow reefs and there's no, uh, no, no reefs here. And we see this sort of out-of-phase behavior where in winter, we find an erosion of the areas behind the reefs. That sand then moves um, alongshore and gets deposited. And in the summer, we get a movement. So we're getting this alongshore movement of, of sediment. So you can see here, as the waves are bigger in winter, if we track the, the shoreline, that we get an erosion, but we get actually in the areas that aren't protected by the reef, we're actually, when the waves are biggest, we're actually getting the, the, the beach growing outwards. So this is very different than your kind of conceptual models of, of beach erosion. Um, one of the other things we've, we've done now and, and quite fortunately captured a, a really extreme event that's um, very rare. We had, coincidentally, not a lot of instruments out during um, Tropical Cyclone Olwen up at Ningaloo Reef. And a category, it was either three or four right on the verge, um, had a direct, so the eye went over, directly over the site. So this is eight, 10 meter um, waves. And we had a lot of instruments, which I won't talk about, measuring the hydrodynamic responses. But we were able to look at and track the, the changes that occurred along this section of coastline. And again, what we found is that there was erosion happening like this, but it was just really redistributing sand alongshore. And if we look at the, the longshore average amount of uh, beach erosion, um, this shown this triangle here, as well as some other studies we looked at. These reefs are almost, there's almost no sediment loss on average along this section of the, the coast. We looked at, um, you know, some, some beaches along, um, say, in the Gulf of Mexico. A lot of these are, are cases where they've looked at s the same kind of scale um, hurricane impacts on beaches where you see really catastrophic erosion. So, so these reefs are really doing a, a really substantial job in terms of reducing the, the, the total erosion that, that occurs. Okay, the last thing I want to do, I'll just go um, just highlight this, and I think this is where the, the biggest challenge is, where I think, you know, the center with its kind of multidisciplinary focus can, can make um, inroads into, is that the, the, there's really strong links also between the, the sediment dynamics in reefs and the, the ecosystem and the state of current ecosystems and the changes that are um, expected. Um, this is because the, the sediments that we find, say, on a reef island like this, they're, they're ultimately sourced from reef organisms that, in the, the, the skeletal material, the calcium carbonate skeletons, that break down over time and form the sediments. Um, the transport characteristics of these sediments are very different than the normal kind of quartz sands that, that occur in mo a lot other coastlines. Um, and also, I mean, I won't talk about this, but also the sediment transport processes are modified by the, the roughness of reefs. But the basic idea is that these reefs are essentially sediment production factories. Um, there's a number of organisms that produce sand. So this is just showing sands from, from Ningaloo, where you can see it's made up of, of reef forams, coral and algal fragments, coral, mollusks, that are all contributing to the, the, the material that's actually providing sand um, to the, the beaches. 
And one of the really challenging things is, is really how do we scale you know, organism responses of calcification um, to, to predict these changes to reef sediment budgets. So for example, there's a lot of organisms that are producing skeletal material. There's some time then, it depends on the process, that's breaking down that material so through various bioerosion processes. And so this is really the crux at, at understanding the, the changes to reef sediment budgets and, and future changes over longer time scales. Um, so the, the basic idea then, and this is where I think there's a lot of room for, for work, is that there's increasing work now linking ecological changes, one more slide, ecological changes to changes in reef um, carbonate budgets. There's increasing work looking at how um, reef accretion rates and the frameworks of reefs are changing. But in terms of sediment budgets and sediment supply to coastline, there's a lot of conflicting literature, you know, whether it's, we'd expect changes over decades or thousands of years. So this is still an unknown question. Okay, so the last summary um, slide is, you know, if we want to really understand the future of, of coral reef coastlines, there's still a lot of unanswered question, a lot of progress being made. But I think the really nasty kind of problems are, are you know, problems that are linking some of the coastal engineering problems with, with these reef ecosystem changes that are occurring. Um, just threw this up, and this is probably an oversimplification, but you know, if we think about climate change effects, you know, we have coastal engineers, geoscientists focusing on storm effects, sea level rise, and so on. Um, a lot of focus, you know, say in the biological community, be looking at ocean acidification temperature effects, but really needing to bridge kind of this gap if we want to actually understand the changes. And so we're moving, moving beyond these traditional coastal engineering approaches. Okay, thanks.